And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Judy Dow. Uh, Judy is an Abenaki educator and artist. Um, she taught for the past 30 years um, of all ages and in the past 10 to 15 has done more work with, um, with youth, with middle and high school students. Um, and in her teaching, she brings in um, traditions and crafts and um, practices from the Abenaki tribe. And as I am <laughs> fairly new to Vermont, Judy, I would love to know if I am saying that correctly. Because um, I know I've heard several different ways of pronouncing it from Beniki to Abenaki, and I would love to um, understand that a little more. <laughs> um, sure. So the, uh, the Algonquin word is Wabanaki. Waban is white, Aki is land. So it's the white land or where the dawn first rises. The English said the word Abenaki. And along the Hudson River Valley into New York were large Dutch settlements, and they said Abenaki. And the French, um, in this very early times, had no sound for W. And so Wabanaki became Abenaki. So all three are correct. It just shows your ancestral background and how you learn to say it. Awesome. That's really good to know. Such rich history here, <laughs> and so many more stories that uh, I know you will you'll touch in on more of the history of this landscape and the the people that have been here and that have come here. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm very excited for more of those stories. <laughs> right. um, do you want to get the the PowerPoint going? Sure. Um, so let me um, explain to you that. Um, I have a lot of stories on here and depending on the time element, we'll just go from one story to another. Um, and so a lot of the teaching I do is around sustainability, history and climate change and, co and culture. And I use a lot of naturals and a lot of recycled materials to teach the children to tell the untold story, to learn how to create a mnemonic device that will help them to tell the story. So for instance, on the right here, we have a yogurt container with all the layers of the crust, the earth's crust. And um, so those colors and those textures um, will help them to um, tell the story that they've learned about the earth's layers. On the left side, we have a gourd and it's burned, burned in uh, the story of, of the annual trip we took every year from, from August in, to um, an April vacation from school until Columbus Day weekend we moved, we traveled to South Era and we lived out there with all my aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and we would travel back in October 12th. And, um, and so that's on that gourd, the long part of it has all the city, the road from the city into the rural area. Uh, let's see. So why do I do this? And um, I do mostly, I started doing this um, for my grandchildren. These are two of my three grandchildren. I now have a new grandchild. And um, I wanted some way to record stories for them, untold stories that they might not know. And so I've been using textiles and baskets and beading to weave in stories that I then tell them from the actual item. Um, and so often I'll work with students about um, what's going on. Irene, the worst flood in 83 years, death and destruction, Philippine typhoon, all these in, um, things, these disastrous things that are happening where we live in this world of, of um, a limited number of plants and animals and birds and fish, and we're traveling through the narrows into a world where all systems as we know are broken. And so I start with the headlines. We talk about those and we talk about how all of that is coming. And um, I explain to them what the narrows are. And then we make postcards. And in that po on that postcards, they, they 
paint or draw or color, whatever the age is, what they want to bring through the narrows to them. And they mail the postcard home and ask family members, what would they like to bring through um, the narrows? And, and of course, then it brings up the question, what are you talking about? What are the narrows? And so then the kids get the opportunity to explain um, that what climate change is and what's happening. And throughout this process, we discuss what a want is and what a need is, and le they learn the difference. And so then it begins to limit, de limit what they want to bring with them and what they need to bring with them. Because at first they um, want to bring things like chainsaws and, and um, iPads and things like that and telephones. And then I tell them all systems are broken. All systems we know are broken. And so then they begin to understand they need very simple and basic things. And we usually come up with things like clean air. We still want night. We still want day. We want seeds. We want, want clean water. We want um, teachings. We want family. And we want plants. They learn about the parts of mapping on a typical map. Meat lines, compass rows, keys or legends, titles, and cartouche. And then they learn that that 2D map is not the only way to tell a story. And they begin to tell the story with 3D items. They might burn a story on a gourd or make a beaded tree or weave around veg, uh, pieces of wood to make vegetables that is in their garden. And each one of these are part of a story that you'll probably see later on. Um, and the, to discover the untold story is all about perspective. So they learn about um, the untold stories could be in storytelling or recordings or in theater. And they learn about um, written and painted and burned and etched. And when you think of it, think about the old textiles and the old baskets. There's many stories in those things but you just might not recognize that there are stories there. Um, they learn uh, graphic novels, plaster of Paris, clay, beads, basket, all kinds of rocks and sculptures, all kinds of things. Whoop, what happened? Um, and we have certain rules of engagement that we use. Um, so the, the, we go by the five R's, respect, responsibility, reverence, responsibility, reciprocity and relationships. Those are the five R's I was raised by. Everything in my life, it revolves around those five R's. And then when I'm working out in um, the environment, the, um, the four sustainable ability questions that we use is, does the practice support reducing energy use? Does the practice contribute to lessening man-made waste? Is it somehow helpful to the environment? And this last one is the one that always gets them. Is there fairness to all living things, human and non-human? And in most of the textbooks, you'll see the first three, but the fourth one is never there. Um, and that comes from indigenous cultures and, and language. Our language is animate and inanimate. So you might look at the Green Mountains and describe them as um, inanimate but if you were talking about mount mansfield then it would be animate it would be alive and so that's what changes back and forth amongst the in the language and the words um they learn learn a lot about research they learn about um, um where to look for that research um, old newspapers um documents all kinds of documents um, this is all about eugenics and the documents, how, how we, when we're looking for that untold story, um, we found a huge number of documents um, and newspaper articles telling that story. Here's an example of the actual eugenics records and um, cemeteries and laws, town records, manuscripts. There's tons of things out there to help you research the untold story. Um, books, new books, old books, um, guidebooks, um, everything. So um, 
we Americans, for instance, on the right hand side was the, was the um, story of Burlington. And as a child, I was asked to read that in 10th grade. And um, when I recognized my family being talked about in that story and the places where I lived being talked about, I began to question. Um, and the teacher said to me, oh, my dear, this is a textbook. You have to believe what's in the textbook. And I was one to never <laughs> believe what I read. So that started um, a lifelong journey for me to figure out what the eugenics was and um, why was my family in there. And so I collected at least 35 years of research on the Vermont Eugenics Survey. And there is, is there any questions about this symbol right here on the set in the center? No? I um, none yet, but maybe in a little well, bit. Well, not anybody recognizes it, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. <laughs> so, um, and old maps. Um, sometimes we get the, the maps in insurance records. Sometimes we get them in um, gazetteers. And sometimes they're just maps on a rock. But maps tell, the, tell a lot of story because the maps were created usually for a purpose. So, Many of the maps have little symbols or um, things on them that say who, who is on the map. And because the, peop the, the insurance companies who made the maps were making it for the people who they insured only. Um, and so the, there's very, it's like those little green ones, those touristy maps you pick up on the corner stores and restaurants these days. Um, all the little ads on the corner, they're on the map and nobody else is because they're the ones who paid the ad to have the map made. And so they tell, a, a, each one tells a different story. Hey Judy, so, before, yeah. before we move on, um, Betsy did have a question about why the swastika. Um, she mentioned she knows it has ancient Hindu origins, but we also know other mm -hmm. ways that it has been used um, by the Nazis. So could you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. Um, it's a, it's a, ancient cultural symbol for a lot of indigenous peoples around the world. And it's symbol, it, it stands for the natural order in which the world turns, in which everything flows, how it goes around. And so when, um, when Hitler used it, he slanted it just lightly to oppose the natural order of things in the world. So when this was um, made, um, it was common practice to use that symbol to talk about the natural order of things. Um, so then the first thing I tell them is let's figure out what, what is your question? What is it? What is the data you want to collect? What is it you want to document and, and know? And we, and then this, the second question is to decide how you're going to show the map. So it might be as simple as um, the headwaters of the Winooski River winding around to the mouth of the Winooski River and showing all the resources along the way. Or it might be a simple hike and documenting all the food we found and then um, putting them into specific bowls, food for medicine, food, material, culture, and religion, and just seeing where those plants would have set, set in the bowls of food and why specific people would have traveled. Um, like Indian Brook, for instance, has 22 biomes on it, and it has the most um, old native sites on it of just about any river in the Chittenden County because everything they needed were on each of those biomes. Um, and the one in the corner is um, schools that I've taught in. There's, it's cross-stitch. So the kids learned how to make a map by cross-stitching and indicating whatever research they wanted to indicate. Um, and um, so this is an old story of um, Odioso, which is the creator of Lake Champlain. And um, 
and in researching that story, we began to follow all the history of the Winooski River, and we burned that in le leather, and we took manila folders, and we made the watershed, and then we put resources down there, folded it up, and made a macaque out of it. And so um, all the old stories are on the land. You know, how one old um, ge geological layer is on top of another at Rock Point, and how the Great Finger Lakes are, are connected with the creation of Lake Champlain and Oziozo. So we learned all of those, and then we began to map them out in various ways. Um, and this is that little beaded tree. So what one class did was they each made a bead, beaded tree. And then we created the, the lake in the middle with blinking lights and beads. And we put our trees on both sides. And then we were able to tell this, the creation story of Oziozo, the creation of Lake Champlain. And their beaded trees became a group story of um, the creation of Lake Champlain. And they painted the little box and they installed lights on it. And uh, um, it was on display at Grace, one of Grace Potter's, um, uh, what do you call it, performances. Um, and then here's yet another way to tell the story. So we, some people burned on gourds, some people painted with watercolors because in the story, when the, when the lake is created, Oziozo reaches up on piles of dirt he's created and, and his fingers make these riverbeds. And so when you're looking at an aerial view, you can actually see the, the, finger, the finger grooves and how they became riverbeds from the actual creation story. Um, these are made by um, students at the Chittenden Correctional Facility. And they were trying to tell the story of their treasured place. Where do they go to? What is their special place they go to? And so they made little pillows out of felt to, to talk about their treasured place. Um, and then sometimes the maps are, are places from your story, from your childhood. So um, here's a little felt book. Each page tells a story about the journey of getting to South Hero. And down here is a watercolor on, um, on muslin. And you can, um, I, I painted each house I've lived in and the connection of that house to the lake. And, um, and then I just set it with heat and quilted it. So it's a little quilted story. Um, and then here's some more of those yogurt um, containers and how we tell lessons from, from um, that we want to create a mnemonic device to retell. So, so we have the layers of the ocean, the layers of the forest, and down at the bottom we have um, a plant cell and a, and a cell from a piece of corn. And so the layers are all monitored in the yogurt container. And then um, I try to teach the kids to use recyclable material in telling their stories. And so this particular felt that we use is all made out of recycled soda bottles. And um, we even pizza boxes we use to retell stories. Um, up on the top is Miller's Bend. Down at the bottom is um, Bolton Flats. And this is the pond in my backyard. So each one has their own story. Um, sometimes there are science lessons we're trying to teach. And the cycle of a monarch or the the maps that show where the mo monarchs go every year and why they're struggling and then down here um i worked with this a uh, statewide program to where the kids created um oh i forgot now i've forgotten the word but you know where you create uh, a small version of something out of plastic the, the machine and then they enter them into contests, but they have to do the history first. And so you can take groups of students from any town in Vermont 
and and follow this through do the history do the research and then make the little the little small plastic item to represent what you're showing um, sometimes we talk about the earth's movements and creating maps we've done this story on paper we've done this story in plaster of paris um, and burning on leather um, and it shows how first we were many um, one continent and then uh, several continents and then one continent and work our way to the, the to the ones we have today um, so sometimes the map addresses a specific community need and um, this was an activity we did in Montpelier and Montpelier as some of you probably know floods every year and we did a lot of research the students researched where it was flood we found an old document where a man was building a house right in front of where the capital is today it wasn't there then and he built three cellar holes by the time he got to the first cellar hole the first three cellar holes were filled with water and um so they knew that was an area that flooded we learned about the north branch and and the Dog River and five other rivers and the confluence of those rivers with the Winooski and Montpelier and the problems that it causes each year when there's a high water event. And so as we walked around and traveled, the kids made mur murals of those places and they made QR codes and we recorded them telling the story of each place, why that was flooded. And um, then we put the QR codes on the maps. And as you can see, they put all the pieces of the map in. They've got the neat lines, they've got the compass rows, they've got the, the key or the legend. So they've added all those map parts that they learned about on this map. And so then um, somebody could then take their phone and put it up to the QR code and hear the child tell the story of that particular spot on the land um and they some map the story in leather some in felt some in clay the same story because we, we were working with k6 so we got many many stories in, in many many levels and before i go to that one and so what they finally did when they did the research they found out that um um the Winus montpelier was in the middle of lake winooski and during the glacial period back at the at the mouth of the lake of the Winooski River back in the Burlington area um, it backed up with ice so bad it created this huge lake called Lake Winooski and um, Montpelier is built in the bottom of the lake and the lake was uh, um, hundreds of feet deep and two miles wide so that's why every spring it keeps reflooding, reflooding, reflooding in Montpelier. And so the kids eventually told the whole story in various ways, which was kind of neat. Um, the same thing happened in Brandon. Um, Brandon flooded like seven times in the 1900s, and then it flooded again in 2011 in exactly the same place every single time. And so again, they were trying to figure out why, why is this happening? And um, they had gone through five town managers during this period of time uh, since 2011 and today. And so they started doing the research and they found out in exactly the same houses and the same places were flooding out year after year after year. Um, this was 1938, here's the same house in 2011 same places flooded out time after time so what we did was we had a pile of sand brought into the backyard of the school and the kids recreated the town with the rivers the Neshby river and otter creek and all, all the other little tributaries and then they put the main roads and they built milk carton houses and they put those milk carton houses on the um on their map which is, was the sand and then we made it rain and they poured water so they poured water down the riverbeds and made it rain 
and and eventually the, you can just see it but um they made it rain and eventually the whole community flooded in exactly the same area again so once these third and fourth graders saw this they went on the road they pull in presented to the school board they presented to the select board their story and their documentation and um the select board said to them wow it's really great it's cost us thousands of dollars to have the science done to figure this out and we haven't convinced the town yet um that's why we keep getting new town managers because they haven't figured out like what they're going to do because in the middle of town is this green this community green that they want to save so they're putting that um over saving that village green um knowing that it's again going to flood sometime which is kind of interesting um the kids map out their stories in various ways they they um they put all their um work together to present to the school board and to the town and the one thing they found out in their research was that their school name was nashby and that was the name of their town uh, originally for 12 years but then it burned down and it, the name was changed it was called brandon afterwards and nashby in the Beniki language means full of water which is exactly what happens with the flooding so they figured that out after a long time um and sometimes um the community needs were trying to understand the history and um because the history has been um, replaced by daughters of the american revolution signs everywhere and so there's this untold story so um down in the brattleboro area and along the connecticut the dar has put up signs documenting this fort documenting that fort and um and it's really interesting because this fort was burned down like many times and and they tell the story over and over within the town and just down the road from there is this meadow which was where king philip met with thousands of men um to plan king philip's war um and so that's not even mentioned and so there's this untold story that's hidden underneath all the dar signs that i work with the students to figure out and um and one of the things i always say to the kids is that the weight of history is considerable and reclaiming it is overwhelming it's an overwhelming task so for instance um at this sign is the corner marker of where new hampshire massachusetts and vermont meet and um and right it's right on top of a cliff and over the edge of the cliff are these little mud um, clumps of mud that are coming out of the base of trees and what they are are 500 year old caches that were built into the edge of this cliff right at that marker that marks the places of the three um the the three states coming together and so they're still there they're indentations now um but it's an amazing 500 year old archaeological site right there at that point um and the same with bellows falls bellows falls is another place where the weight of history is considerable because of the there's a whole nother story to be told about those um petroglyphs um, those happy face petroglyphs that are on the walls at bellows falls um so with the kids we're we try to i try to teach them the best they can to tell the story the untold story so we walk the terraces along the connecticut river so that they learned about um um lake hitchcock the formation of lake, lake hitchcock and how the water backed all the way up the connecticut to about the canadian border and how all these different terraces impacted and like this one the you probably can't tell but the young girl is looking down off the top the ledge the top terrace and she she's trying to show you that there's many terraces there and the same as this person did and this person 
they're all different um, terraces and it was kind of a neat way for them to learn. And um, then they started duplicating the story of the terraces and their yo yogurt baskets. And, and then in Springfield, um, there's this story, they wanted to pick a story. So they decided on the story of John Knott, the first settler in Springfield, because he was in the first chapter of every history book they could find. And um, the story in the textbooks all said that he survived his first year with the Indians at French Meadows because his wife was a half breed. And his house wasn't completely done so he really had no place to live. So he lived with them and he moved around. He had different jobs in that area and he was considered a squat, squatter when Bennington Wentworth went to sell that land. So at that point in time, he had to purchase land. So we mapped out every place we lived and we began to wonder about that story about his first year. So we did the genealogy and what we discovered was he had lied to the Indians. His wife wasn't a half breed at all, quote, and that she had um, both him and his wife were the uh, third generation um, from from England. And so then um, again, another untold story that we try to tell is about the plants and and documenting the plants, documenting the land, documenting, um, uh, reading the land and documenting the story from a different play, different direction, a different way. Um, and so one place we did that in Swanton was we used um, a boat and we traveled along the river and many of their places in the river, um, the, the, Beaver lodges are being built on the side of the river and they're getting flooded out. The trees are uprooting and tipping over um, that support the houses for the eagles and the osprey. Their cranberry beds are underwater. And what we, when we started to map that all out, the kids mapped where their homes were. Then we went to an archaeological site and we found out that the edge of the river was at once at this archeological site. And we began to discover that all of their homes 7,000 years ago would have been underwater and that that is all happening now. It's starting to repeat its story in that all those same places are beginning to flood again. Um, And here you go, they, they found where the river was um, and that their house will, would now be underwater. Um, at, at the middle school in Hunt, um, we used the four sustainable questions to determine um, if there was a sustainable project in Burlington. And so the first place they thought about going to was the interval and when they took those four questions and applied them to every business in the interval there was only one field that they believed would pass the test of those four questions so we dug up the soil in the middle of the winter and we tested the soil and it was high high in arsenic lead and carcinogens we wrote to the state and the state wrote back to us told us the land was unsuitable for growing food for human consumption. And, um, and so the kids were outraged. These were middle schoolers and there's like, everything is, there's no gray. It's either black or white for them. And um, so they started presenting, they started going on the road and they presented, um, um, the, the farmers couldn't speak English um, because they were, it, that was an immigrant farm. So they went to the principal and asked for permission to explain to their school that they did an assembly in the school and the children who could, of the, of the farmers could speak English and they, uh, they heard the story and eventually everything changed. Um, at Indian Brook, it's the same story. 
we there there's a now a tourist trail there a two and a quarter mile tourist trail that surrounds the brook and it at one time was a road with farms and so using gps's we walked through the road and we used um cellar holes or plants to help identify where the farms are and we created digital maps so we took waypoints with the J gps's so in the middle of the forest you found things like um, um tiger lilies well when we looked around we found the cellar hole and these were the tiger lilies on the front lawn we found black locusts that surrounded the yards and lilacs in the middle of the forest so eventually we were able to track down the um, farms just by simply asking what doesn't belong there so for plants what doesn't belong there and so finally they created digital maps to tell the story they burned and they did watercolors and and um and then another week we i took kids in burlington we did the same thing we tracked down the eugenics the people who did the targeting and eugenics records where they lived where those who were targeted lived we made all kinds of digital maps and again the weight of history is considerable but the act of reclaiming history is overwhelming but we decided that when you looked at the kids it was important for the kids to all know the untold story or the the story that um, could be at some time repeated and um so that's why i do what i do um so maps can be where you least expect them uh so these are in nickshooks and up north where they have little trees um and um they make these huge nickshooks out of stone because there's plenty of stone up there and if you look at the arms the arms point the direction of the path and if you look through the legs, you should see where the next and next shook is. Um, and so they help you to um, find the untold story up there. So they're everywhere. Um, working with new immigrants in Burlington, um, we created uh, instruments um, from, their, from their homelands, and then we mapped out the instruments. We um, had a musician come and work and they made music together with all the instruments once they were dry and i don't think this will work but maybe nope um so anyways that's it um i do this all the time i use a lot of recyclables and um and i get them to uh critically think through the story what was the story before whatever it is they see now was there and it might include reading the land it might include doing research awesome. judy i had a, a question would you be open to sharing the story that you told me um, when we spoke on the phone a while ago um, about how you taught that little physics lesson um, with when you had the police officer come with his radar gun um, right. i thought that was a really great story that shows another way that um you can you can teach lessons on um, math and science in a much more interesting way <laughs> yeah um so i was working with a middle school class and the math teacher was like um well you can't teach ethnic studies with math it's impossible i'm like no it's not impossible we can do this you watch and so I said, what are you working on? He said, data collection. And I said, well, what are you collecting for data? He goes, um, well, we're gonna pick different things and just have them do it for homework, figure out like how many restaurants there are in town and that kind of stuff. And so I said, well, let's do something interesting. So I took um, a spear thrower called an atlatl and a spear and well, my husband's supposed to be answering the phone while I'm on the call, but apparently he's missing it. <laughs> um, and so we took these spear th throwers and first the kids threw the spear with their hand and they were learning metrics. And so they measured it and they recorded the data. Then they threw it with the atlatl and it went about 10 times 
further and the police officer had a radar gun. He was measuring the speed and it went a hundred times faster. And so they collected the data as every kid went through the process of um, throwing it. They collected all the data and then they made amazing charts showing the different data that they had collected. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, the, the police officer was like, after the kids were gone, he's like, can I throw that? And I'm like, yeah. So he throws it and then he's like, will you take my picture for my son? <laughs> and then he poses with the adle adle. I took his picture. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, I think something that struck me both through what you were sharing tonight and when we talked previously um, is the ways that you are empowering students for like to be curious about the space around them and not just take what they see at face value to not just see, you know, the, the daughters of American Revolution signs and be like, oh, that's the only history in this place because you know, there's so much his, history is written by those that are in power um, or that ha, are currently claiming um, ownership over a place for good or for bad. And um, it erases a lot of stories. Um, in particular, I find it really powerful to have young students be researching eugenics and understanding that story in this state because a lot of people don't know about that not only with the uh, Abenaki people, but with so many other people, um, you know, any non-white person, you know, has often that those communities have been um, the the victims of, of involuntary sterilization. And um, for those stories to not be known is, um, it's a shame because we're missing out on an important part of, um, of understanding the, the people and the place where we live. Um, and I think that's really incredible and really um, needed in this world as we're living in it um, to understand those stories that we aren't being told so that we can have a renewed, um, a new perspective on the world around us and understand that there isn't all roses and rainbows, which I don't think anyone this year thinks it is. <laughs> I'll just say that. I don't think it is either. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, so for me, it's important to start on those difficult topics as early as possible with children. Um, and you can do it. You just have to change your language. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, instead of talking in third grade about sterilization, you might talk about, they make it, um, so it's not possible to have babies, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And so you just change the words and they totally get it. Yeah. Um, and it's important because if, if they get the wrong idea, like many kids do on kindergarten and first grade with the first Thanksgiving, mm. it, that myth goes all the way up till they're old enough to see there's another story. And sometimes in their minds, it never changes. Yeah. It's still that myth that stays with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the stories that come after, perhaps, even if they're more accurate, don't hold as much weight because they aren't tied to some the memories in their heart of growing up with a certain Thanksgiving tradition. It right. takes so the um, a lot of unlearning. Story. Yeah, um, so the untold story is what I try to get them to look for. Yeah, yeah, that's really powerful. Um, yeah, I love that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a... Uh, you know, I, in college, I read um, different parts of, of people's history of the United States, yeah. um, which is, it's that in a, in a certain sense of telling the, the stories that aren't told. And, um, you know, I think that there's a, uh, there's, there's a tendency to want to read about things, but, but not necessarily knowing or, or understanding how to go out and find that information. And there's so much information to be found on any curiosity that that one may have and doing right. that research import is important to like understand um you know one how the world works how records are kept how to find them how to read the landscape like it teaches so many um powerful skills that are helpful at any any stage in life with any um project or anything like that right 
Um, we have a uh, comment from Erin Mailey O'Keefe, who you know, I believe. Um, she said, I see how deeply, how you are deeply forming the next generations to read and care for the land in all life. Your teachings activate indigenous ways of being. Judy, I always learn so much from you. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. <laughs> uh, Erin and I were going to work together on a project before COVID hit. And it kind of got put on the shelf, but hopefully we'll be able to do it. What was that project, if you don't mind sharing? Um, well, it's a it's a project that Erin has um, uh, in the Whetstone um, River. That there's this one section that keeps flooding, and prior to what it is now, or what it was up until 2011, was a a place for elderly to live and it got severely flooded and so um, we were going to use the schools the kids in the schools to help read the land determine the story and um and the water quality and what what might be a good use for that piece of land in the future um, and i think that kind of thing has to happen because the kids are the future mm -hmm. And so to include them in the creation of what the future is going to look like um, is, is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so Aaron works with community um, projects and I work with kids. And so putting them together is like a perfect match in my book. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's a perfect, perfect match. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, I find that really interesting too. There's been so much talk of um, like youth-led movements, just even in the last handful of years and especially now. Um, but, you know, the, the wisdom and knowledge of elders is so incredibly important, but also there is wisdom that travels both ways. And I think that once we, as a society and a culture, make that more of an understanding and a norm that um, more good can happen. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope <laughs> I did a project with uh, seventh and eighth graders down in Brattleboro and it was an interval that for a hundred years had been built up by a saw company to prevent sawmill company to prevent their logs from floating away mm -hmm. but it was causing um, severe flooding upstream for other people in the community so the land trust bought the land and they were going to put it back to its original state. So they asked the kids to do the research on it and to, to create a proposal for the town as to what it might look like in the future. And we worked on it for probably three months, um, doing the research, comparing it to an ancient interval. And, um, and then uh, they did a proposal, probably 120 people in the community showed up. And it was so well received, they asked um, the kids to serve on the conservation committee and the planning committee for the town. Cool. So a couple of the kids put their names in to get put on the committees. And, and that's like so cool, right? It's yeah. so important. It's so important to inc include the younger people. That's amazing. I love yeah. that. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. Um, well, if anybody has any questions or comments, um, please type them in now. We're coming up close to eight o'clock, um, but there's still some time if there's any last little things. Um, and uh, next week we have another one. Tune in for that one too. Uh, you can use the same link to, to connect on Zoom. Um, our speaker next week is Shelley Halstead, who's the founder of Black Women Build Baltimore. And she's going to talk about. Um, the, her, her program, her structure of her organization that um, not only empowers black women to learn skills to increase opportunity, but does a lot more to address some of the, um, the like structural societal limitations to opportunity and, and um, gener creating generational wealth. So it's gonna be a really awesome topic. Um, let's see, any questions coming in? Oh, here we go. Okay, hi Judy, Graham here from Yestramara, one of our current semester students. Um, this is a super interesting talk 
and I think it's really incredible how you're using active lessons to inspire learning about the world and land we live on and the people who live here and all over the world. Do you have any advice on how we can fix the problems that you're addressing in, edu in the education system throughout the United States on a large scale and how other communities around the US can do what you're doing? Well, you know, I, I've kind of seen this um, COVID-19 as a double-edged sword. Um, I used to travel all over New England teaching uh, about the way I teach, modeling for teachers and doing teacher trainings. And now I do the same thing through Zoom, although I get really tired of sitting and Zoom calls all day long. It, I keep thinking in my mind how much fuel I'm saving, how much wear and tear on my car I'm sharing. And so a lot of what I do now is to present something, whatever the topic is, something around the topic, and then to ask the students to go out and explore that same thing where they are. Mm -hmm. And then we come back together and we talk about their findings and compare it to my findings. And, um, and I think it's a model. I mean, how do you teach um, from a book about the land mm -hmm. unless you go out and get on the land? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a model that um, I've been using and it's been working that I think many people should be picking up in the future. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should be doing everything straight by book and sitting in a classroom. Yeah. But I think getting them out and letting them explore and critically think, why is this like this? Mm -hmm. um, will develop skills that will be so much more useful in their world when they get older. Yeah. I wonder, um, have you ever thought of how in like a more urban environment, these same things could be applied? Like I know that there's just, I'm very much a plant person too. And so even when I'm in cities, I'm looking for where the fruit trees are, you know, <laughs> where the herbs are growing. Um, but I wonder, you know, does, if a similar type of thing could be um, encouraged, but in a different format, looking at an urban setting. If that's what you're talking yeah, to. I actually teach in Queens and the Bronx a lot. Oh, cool. Um, and so we do um, ethnobotany um, lessons on the, the plants growing in the cracks of sidewalks. Awesome. And um, we monitor, we've done, I did a re big research project one time on pigeons, because um, the pigeons in New York used to migrate, but they no longer migrate, oh. because they've developed the skills to live off what humans leave behind. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so we, we spent a long time monitoring them and watching them, Mm -hmm. and seeing how they maneuver. They're like little kamikazes dropping down in the middle of a sidewalk full of people to get what they need for food. Wow. And so they're no longer migrating. And That's so there's lots of projects that you can do um, in cities. Yeah, That's cool. Yeah. Um, we have one more question from Morgan, another one of our semester students. Um, what are other ways that your students have used storytelling as a way to create change? Um, well, each, each topic that I, because I have to connect with the topics that teachers want to do, right? right? So each topic, I suggest that at the very end of their research, they present to somebody either the select board, the school board, or their peers within the school. And many times when they've um, uh, done that, when they've presented, it's been a whole nother lesson to them. Mm -hmm. um, and like, like when Lyman C. Hunt presented their research, the kids, um, the, the governor came to their presentation at ECHO. The governor. Um. <laughs> I mean, these are 11 and 12 year old kids who are like floored, you know? And then when I did a eugenics project with um, the third and fourth grade kids at Guilford, um, VPR did a program on it for them, interviewed them and did a program because um. they were surprised that third and fourth graders were learning about eugenics. Yeah. And so, 
And the guy who did it, he, he was like, he had these questions like, um, well, don't you think you're too young for this? And the kids were like, am I too young to know the difference from right and wrong? Uh. <laughs> Are you telling me I shouldn't know this past history because it was so bad? So, and they were asking the reporter, these questions and the guy just sat there with his mouth open <laughs> because and so it gives them it empowers them to want to learn number one yeah. and then number two share because if they share this untold story people are like wow that's really great you know mm -hmm. and they're so proud they develop this this sense of pride that's great yeah that's awesome. So they did, we did the untold story in Guilford um, in 2018. And, and we um, made a list of people that are in our community that nobody ever hears about or talks about. So like the guy who picks up the trash, the guy that works at the recycle plant, the, um, um, there's a whole bunch of them anyways. We made a list of them and the kids did interviews. They interviewed them all. And then um, they wrote a poem about um, that person and they drew a picture about that person. I transferred that picture to a quilt square and we put together a quilt of the stories of the unknown people, untold stories of the people in their community. And that quilt, it hangs in the rest area and when you come up 91, the first rest area in Vernon, yeah. mm -hmm. it hangs on the wall there with a binder of their poetry. Cool. And so that's amazing. I know. And imagine how the people in that community feel who, who never, you know, people have taken for granted. They just do their job every day. Right. Yeah. And they, here they are on display at the, at the rest area. Yeah. So, so there's, cool. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of really cool things you can do to empower the kids to want to learn and to share. Yeah, I feel for me at least the the piece about having this the students sharing um, feels almost the most impactful in my my experience in in school as a young person. Um, you know, if you are presenting, it's to your classmates, and that's pretty much it. Um, but to have um, especially to be in like third grade, fourth grade, and having um, like a wide audience of adults that hold some some degree of power that third or fourth grader doesn't quite. It does, in a sense, instill in them a sense of confidence and power that they can have an impact on the world with their curiosity, with their insight, with their research, and with their words and sharing it. Um, I, I'm gonna keep remembering the image of uh, the reporter just jaw dropped. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think I that's mean, amazing. well, the teacher and I were like holding our breath because we weren't sure what they were gonna say. <laughs> I mean, we had worked hard on the lesson, right? Yeah. But you never know what uh, a nine year old's gonna say or, eight, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I was like a nine or 10 year old, and I was like, Oh my God, when this little girl said, are you telling me I'm not old enough to know right from wrong? <laughs> Sat there and went, oh. <laughs> it was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> they, they did a good job. And yeah. the, the thing on VPR was good too. So Yeah, we'll have to check that out. Yeah. Well, awesome. This was, this was wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Judy. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to keep following what you're up to and you know especially as the world continues to shift how what you do shifts um but i yeah i'm very grateful that you took the time to share some of these untold stories with us um tonight and Great. i hope to stay in touch <laughs> thank you take care thank bye. you bye <laughs>